Hi guys, and welcome to our channel. My name is Elizabeth. Now, before we get started on this case, I want to extend out our thoughts and prayers to the loved ones of this beautiful soul, Peggy Nadell. Nadell was born in Brooklyn, New York on October 11th, 1933. She grew up in Brooklyn where she would meet and fall in love and would marry her warm and kind-hearted husband, Robert Nadell. Between them, they had two children, a girl named Susan and a boy named James. Peggy's husband did pass away in 2003. Now back in the 60s, after having kids and being a stay-at-home wife, she had went back to studying and then she eventually got a job at Xerox. Can't type. I don't take dictation. I won't sharpen pencils. I can't file. My boss calls me indispensable. Miss Jones. Just a minute. Will you make a copy of this? Naturally. I pushed the button on the Xerox 914. Xerox is a company that makes copies and printing papers. It's a photocopier. He was a person that would work hard and it did show. She was one of the few women that would go up in the company. And later, after Peggy's husband had passed away, she would then retire and would travel the world. Peggy was a very attractive woman. She was flamboyant, with big hats, and always nicely dressed, mostly in black. She was a political activist and did care about her Jewish community. Peggy Nadell lived on 644 Andover Road in Valley Cottage, which overlooks the Lake De Forest. The neighborhood that she did live on, it was pretty safe. She did live alone. Now Susie, she would marry a welder named Bobby. Now Susie and her husband Bob would spend quality time with Peggy. James would marry a woman named Diana, and they both had two children named Leah and Harris. They had moved to Florida in 1998. Peggy loved spending lots of time with her grandchildren. She doted on them. She would, like many grandmothers, she'd spoil them. Peggy was very close to all her children and grandchildren. Peggy would help Diana and her son James, both financially, by giving them thousands of dollars monthly. She would even fly her grandchildren, Leon Harris, from Florida to her home so she can spend quality time with them. Susie and Bobby, they did live close to Peggy, and Susie would call her mom every day just to talk to her and to check up to make sure she's okay because she was getting up in the age but even though she was still very much active. Then on January 25th, 2014, Peggy had called her mom like she had done many times before, but this time there was no answer. Now at first, Susie had thought she might be just showering or maybe going out checking the mail. She had left a message to have her mom call her back, but she never did. 
Susie had waited a few minutes and called her phone again. No answer. Then Susie had called her home phone. Still, Peggy was not answering. She had then called Diana, who lived in Florida, and asked her if she had heard from her mom. And Diana said no, but that she did call her at 7.30 in the morning. There was no answer. Fearing that something might have happened to her, due to it was very snowy and cold in January of 2014. So Susie had drove over to her mom's house just to make sure she was all right. As she got out of her car, she did notice that her mom's car was there. Susie thought she might have gotten hurt. As she walked in, she was met with silence. She had walked around and then she found her mom lying on the floor at the bottom of the stairs. Susie had thought she might have tripped and lost her balance. As she looked closer, she saw a knife sticking out of her chest. She had then panicked and took out the knife, thinking she might have tripped over her cat and fell with the knife and then hit her head. Susie started to try to do CPR, even though Peggy was cold and not alive. She panicked and dialed 911. Right away. Ma'am, calm down. What's going on there? I think my mom fell down the stairs and with a knife in her hand and stabbed herself. She had told the 911 operator that her mom must have tripped over the cat, fell down the stairs with a knife, and stabbed herself. The arriving Clarkstown Sergeant Glenn Cummings arrived on the scene about 1 p.m. He had been briefed by the detectives on what they had found. The detectives had seen the type of crime before and knew it was not as what it looked like. She had been beaten, strangled, and then stabbed to death. To the detectives, it had started in the bedroom first, then to the landing at the bottom of the stairs. As the detectives looked around, in the kitchen, chairs that had been pulled out, like if she was being talking to somebody that she knew. Peggy's computer had been taken also her purse and jewelry. Whoever it was had tried to make sure it looked like it was burglary, but the detectives knew all this had been staged, that it was not a burglary. That things had been placed there, not like a typical burglary where everything is ransacked and thrown about. It was perfectly placed. As the detectives went outside to the snow, there was no footprints whatsoever. The only thing that was there was the footprints of the responding officers. Also, the detectives noticed that the door had been opened from the inside, so there was no forced entry, and the key was still in the door. Uh, we spoke just a second ago with uh, Sergeant Glenn Cummins, and this is what he has to say. Uh, the investigation is still in its nascency. All we can release at this point is that we're investigating a suspicious death of an 81-year-old female, Peggy Nadell, and she lives at 644 Andover Road in Valley Cottage. Again, the investigation is still in its infancy, so that's all the information that we can release at this point. It was a, an individual that had really a love affair for our town and cared deeply about the community, and uh, her, her death is just shocking to, to all of us. Peggy was a wonderful lady, you know, and our condolences to her family. You know, a really nice lady. The first suspects the detectives had on their sights was Susie and Bobby. Susie had taken out the murder weapon, which did not look good on her part doing that. Being interviewed, she did tell them that there are many landscapers, modelers, that had been around her mom's house. There were no prints found, nor was there no evidence left behind. And looking into Peggy's finances, she was a very wealthy woman. In her estate, she had over $4 million. After talking to the investigators, Susie and Bobby would eventually hire an attorney. As the police were looking into the murder, they had found out that in the early hours just before the murder, Peggy had got a call from a burner phone to her home. Now, a burner phones are normally used in case of emergencies but mostly used by drug dealers, someone having an affair, or planning a murder. Then, shortly after the call, Peggy's house alarm had went off. The alarm company had called to make sure everything was all right. 
Hello, this is the Monitoring Center oh, with Bullet yes. Security. This is Peggy Nadell. The uh, code word is uh, Max. I'm sorry. That's okay, ma'am. I'm, I'm glad everything's okay. Yeah. We'll disregard for you. Have a good day. So whoever it was that called her, Peggy must have trusted them and known them. It appeared they had sat down and talked, and then something went horribly wrong. With this information, the police had started to look elsewhere other than Susie due to them tracking Susie's movements that day. There was really nothing out of the ordinary or suspicious. The detectives started looking into James and Diana, who were all the way down in Florida. James said he was near Miami, and Diana was in Washington, D.C. at a friend's wedding, the time of the murder. In looking at the phone records, they both were where they said they were at. But Diana's activities from her phone records was raising some eyebrows on what was really going on and what she was doing and who she was calling. These numbers were random. She had called them often in DC, but she had never called them before nor again. The numbers she had called were not anyone that were planning on going to the wedding or were even linked to it. She did not speak to a single person that night of the murder. Those few days in Washington, D.C., she had conflicted stories about what she was doing. Then her story started to get holes in it. The burner phone, the police had traced it to where it was bought from and when. Getting the records of it and the video footage from the place that it was bought from, it was purchased in Florida near the home of Diana and James. In looking at the footage, the detective saw who it was, and in shock, it was not Diana. It was Karen Samuel. She was the one that bought the phone. She was a friend of Diana's, who had called Diana a lot. Karen was not the one that activated, though. You have to have the number to activate it. It was activated by another woman named Andrea Benson, who had been linked as a frequent caller to Diana. Now, Karen was the only one that just bought the phone. Diana said she was in Washington, D.C., but now she is linked to a burner phone that was used to call Peggy the night she had been killed. Now, the detectives know as Diana was the daughter-in-law, she was going to get a nice inheritance from Peggy's passing. The police got the CCTV footage that Diana was shown meeting Andrea. They had hung out that day, and this footage was really the first time they had both actually met each other in person. Then the police had traced Andrea's phone, and she had traveled to Hudson Valley. All while Diana's phone was in D.C., and the detectives thought, was she really in D.C. as she had claimed? Wiretapped calls showed that Diana's friends had said she was in D.C. It was 9 in the morning to 6. No, was it 9 at night to 6 in the morning? Right, exactly. Which one, 9 at 6? 9 at night, 9 at 6 in the morning. Oh. Oh. Did Diana stay overnight with you? Yes, not, she, she was with me 9 o'clock and she then leaves me until 6. Mm -hmm. Diana had also spoke to Karen Samuels, telling her she was there. Not in D.C., but in Peggy's house. She did see that she was there at the lockdown. Did she tell you who stabbed her? No. She had confessed to her. After the interview with Karen, they felt they had enough to arrest Diana. It was in May 2004, her and Andrea were charged with first and second degree murdering Peggy. But the investigation into the murder of Mrs. Peggy Nadell is active and ongoing. As in any criminal investigation, we will have to be circumspect in what we can and cannot release to the public at this time. I can report to you that the following people were arrested on Tuesday, May 20th, 2014, in relation to the Peggy Nadell homicide, Diana Nadell, age 50, Andrea Benson, age 25. 
It had come out that Diana had paid Andrea $10,000 to help her kill her mother-in-law. The day that they first met, Diana had just come out and asked her if she would help her kill Peggy, and Andrea said okay. And this is when they drove all the way back from DC to Peggy's house. Along the way, they had activated the burner phone and called Peggy in the middle of the night. They had showed up at one o'clock in the morning. The investigators surmise that Peggy might have gotten a bad feeling and left and headed upstairs. Then she was followed by them. And this is where it all started and ended at the bottom of the stairs. Andrea told the police that as she and Diana walked down the stairs with Peggy, that she had used the pocketbook to strap and choke Peggy. Andrea further stated that Diana threw something at Peggy and hit her in the head with an object and stabbed her mother-in-law more than twice. Not only they had arrested Diana and Andrea, they had also arrested Tanisha Joyner for the one that said Diana was with her, giving her an alibi. All along, Diana left her phone with Tanisha in Washington, D.C., who had made all those different calls to make it look like Diana was there. The charges were rendering criminal aid. She had been given a false alibi for Diana. Karen Samuels was not charged due to she was the only one that just bought the phone and cooperated with the investigation. It also did appear that James had no clue to what his wife was really up to in murdering his own mother. Andrea Benson did plead guilty on her part and would be given a sentence to 20 years to life. Andrea will be eligible for parole in May of 2034. But Diana, she pleaded not guilty. Charges against this woman have been upgraded to first-degree murder for her alleged role in a brutal crime that left an 80-year-old woman dead. All of them agreed to testify against Diana. Her scheming didn't stop there, though. When she was in jail, awaiting her day in court, she had tried to get Karen Samuels, the one that told the investigators that Diana had told her she was there in Peggy's house that night. She tried to get her killed. And then I said, it's absolutely imperative for one in Miami, he's got to get rid of After confronted with this, Karen had changed her plea to guilty. I would like to say that I'm very sorry for my actions and that I am extremely sorry for any pain I may have caused, especially to my husband. She would get a sentence to 23 years to life in prison. She will be eligible for parole in May of 2037. In this sentencing phase, things in the court did erupt and got a little heated. You were born in paradise and you're going to die in hell. You had the audacity to come back to New York and pretend to mourn after brutally strangling, bludgeoning, and stabbing my mother to death. Also, Susie's husband, Bobby, had got upset and had to be removed from the court. Bye, Diane. She's a fucking piece of garbage. Have a seat. Ma'am, have a seat. Everybody remain seated. Don't worry about the glasses. Everybody stay seated. All the things that Peggy had done for James and Diana, it still was not enough in Diana's eyes. She used the money for fertility treatments, cosmetic surgery, treating Peggy like a personal ATM machine to fund her growing lavish lifestyle. She also needed the cash to keep up the appearances. All she saw was dollar signs, and she used her children as pawns to get more money out of Peggy, knowing it would destroy Peggy if she was not able to see or contact her grandchildren, refusing to let Peggy see them unless there was money attached. Then greed had taken over, and she started to plot the murder of Peggy. 
Diana's husband, James, 53, who is not charged in the case and had continued to support his wife after her arrest, he was opposed to his sister speaking at the sentencing. As for his sister Susie, she said they are not on speaking terms. He is still supporting Diana, even though she plotted and did kill his mother. This is it for this case today. Thank you so much for being here. If you'd be so kind to hit the like, subscribe, and the bell to get notified for more cases yet to come. Until next video, please be safe and take care.